friends, it's The Stitches. I've been thinking about the nature of fashion a lot lately. What makes fashion fashion? What is it that specifically distinguishes the utilitarian need to wear clothing from the art form of fashion? Well, much like any other art form, you can't really strictly define what it is, you can really only define what it is isn't. After all, I can never tell you what a painting is supposed to look like, I can only tell you what a painting probably shouldn't look like. So in order to understand what makes an outfit fashion as opposed to clothing, I suppose we should turn our attention to those who deem themselves anti-fashion. And I feel that there are a few key moments in recent fashion history that really exemplify this. If you actually google the term anti-fashion, you will first of all probably be met with at least one picture of David Bowie, but you will also undoubtedly come across two names with regularity, Rei Kawakubo and Yoji Yamamoto, both of whom being Japanese designers who went to Paris during the early 80s to show on the runway. Now let's give some historical background for those of us who weren't alive during the 80s. The first fast fashion brand was Zara, and they opened their doors in 1975, specializing in, well, knockoffs. By the 80s, Zara restructured its business model and invented the idea of instant fashions, aka fast fashion, allowing for expansion by 1985. Stateside, US mall culture experiences a huge boom as cheaper, trendier fashions become more mainstream. And don't get me started on the opulence and sex appeal of the luxury designer world. The runway was covered in glitter, bright colors, funky shapes, and did I mention sex appeal? Enter Yoji Yamamoto and Rei Kawakubo, this absolute power couple from Japan, arriving in the fashion capital of the world, sending this down the runway. And this. And this. It was absolutely revolutionary. Of course, if the entire existence of the YouTube comment section has taught us anything, it's to expect the avant-garde to get some... naysayers? Early critiques included statements comparing their work to... Hiroshima. Okay, but why though? And used terms like nuclear bomb and natural catastrophe, which is highly insensitive for reasons that I shouldn't have to explain. You grew up in Japan um, in kind of the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Um, how do you think that has influenced your creativity and your aesthetic? Oh. Uh, as I, I was uh, educated and grew up, only son of war widow, I was, uh, I was naturally pushed to look the society through my mother. It means I looked society through women. It was my destiny. Despite initial backlash, the deconstructed aesthetic that featured asymmetry, torn clothing, unfinished clothing, minimal color palettes, and an emphasis on comfort and high quality materials over the trends of the era became highly influential. This not only inspired the next generation of luxury designers, but streetwear as well, as economic downturn in the 90s combined with anti-fashion ideals from the 80s would lead to the popularity of grunge. Sadly, in 2021, it's fairly easy to look back on these early runway shows and not see them for being as important as they were. It certainly wasn't the first time an anti-fashion movement fundamentally changed the industry. Just look at the 20s. That was a massive shift in fashion culture. And it wasn't totally organic. The 20s flapper look was just as much a political statement as it was a fashion statement. But what happened in the 80s and 90s was at such odds with the industry that it completely redefined what we thought fashion design could be. Prior to this, you were expected to dress for other people. There were rules about what you wore in public. Not because it made the wearer comfortable, but because it signaled your status to those around you. Prior to the 70s, your clothing was dictated by your class and taste. 
And then the transition into the 80s called for a higher opulence, and even more opportunities to pursue garish displays of wealth. So when all of a sudden you had a new crop of designers saying, fuck this, fuck wealth, forget fashion, let's start something new, it was a little bit jarring. We had an entire industry telling us that you have to dress a certain way in order to be respected. Then all of a sudden these other designers are saying, Let's get rid of the ideas that have been around for a long time, such as folklore and traditions, and let's start again with something new. But despite the fact that this kind of style hadn't really ever been done before, it's certainly been done since. In fact, these early shows by Yamamoto and Comme des Garçons seem almost boring and pretentious to us in contemporary times. The minimalist aesthetic of the anti-fashion movement of the 80s and 90s became so popular that in order to maintain originality, Rei Kawakubo had to take Comme des Garçons in the complete opposite direction, introducing wild color palettes into her work in 1996. Hmm, I wonder what other wildly colorful fashions were popularized in 1996. Anyway, moving on. I can't help but notice a little bit of irony here. While the anti-fashion movement certainly subverted our expectations, the market still reacted to it the same. Despite Yoji Yamamoto claiming to hate fashion design, it, it still says fashion designer on his Wikipedia page. Let's discuss another designer who also occasionally gets labeled anti-fashion but took a dramatically different approach to their career. Vivian Westwood originally worked as a school teacher, as initially she couldn't really see herself being able to make a living wage off of art. But after eventually meeting Malcolm McLaren through her brother, she became the stylist for the Sex Pistols. In fact, even before the Sex Pistols took off, the two opened a shop in London in 1971. Originally the shop was named Let It Rock, but after visiting New York City and inter interacting with the punk scene there, the shop was renamed Sex. And in the following years, Vivian Westwood would become largely responsible for defining the punk look. Then eventually in the 1980s, the shop was renamed again to World's End. McLaren and Westwood separated, which is a good thing because the relationship was pretty toxic, and Westwood started to release collections inspired by history, including the famous Minicrin in 1985. When anti-fashion designers were producing stripped-down minimalism in the 1990s, Vivian Westwood went in the complete opposite direction, and brought her own brand of punk opulence to the table, marrying the world of alternative culture and high fashion design, but somehow equally as unwearable as the stereotypical anti-fashion. Not only that, but her brand had a message behind it as well. She told people to buy less, buy consciously, and hold on to things that you love. Vivian Westwood used her position as a public figure to draw attention to important social issues. In fact, these days, advocacy makes up the majority of Westwood's day-to-day -day activities, most of the actual business being run by a small team of designers. My thing as a fashion designer, I say buy less clothes, keep wearing things that you've really chosen that you love, and that is status. I'm the only fashion designer who really cares so much to analyze what they do in broader cultural terms. That's the only way that I can stimulate my intelligence. So we have these two very different approaches to creating fashion that deviates from the norm. They're both avant-garde and they're both critical of the industry, but in very different ways. So what do these approaches have to say about anti-fashion? And in turn, what does anti-fashion have to say about the industry as a whole? Well, first of all, we've been talking for a hot minute now, and I did just dump a ton of information on you. So let's take a quick commercial break and regroup. So far we've discussed two very different approaches to anti-fashion. One very minimalist and stripped down version, and one very extravagant and over the top version. In both approaches we see a common theme, clear and purposeful deviation from the current trends. In fact, when asked about the purpose of anti-fashion design, Yoji Yamamoto had this to say. Anti-fashion. Anti it means simply, I don't follow the trend. But is anti-fashion really so simplistic? And what does that imply about the greater fashion industry? That it is simply trend-obsessed and nothing more? I mean, certainly not, right? There is a difference between fashion and trend. I'm sure most of us are already aware of the difference between fashion and style. Fashion being industry-defined and style being personally defined. And oftentimes there is some overlap between the two. You may have even seen a Venn diagram that looks something like this. However, I feel that this is a just overly simplistic view. I would argue 
argue that a more realistic diagram would look something more like this. It's all clothing, or at least technically. I guess it can't really be called fashion with a capital F unless it's at least somewhat purposeful. And then within fashion as the art of dressing, we have the distinctions between industry trends and personal style. Because that is what I feel that anti-fashion has to teach us about fashion. That fashion is just an art form like any other. Garments are designed just like a canvas is painted or clay is sculpted. And just like any other art form, you can make run-of-the-mill mugs, dog portraits on Etsy, pin back buttons. But that isn't all that art is, because art is also this, and this, and this. Much like the greater art industry needed anti-artists to push boundaries and open our horizons to new concepts of what art could be, fashion needed anti-fashion designers to show us that there really are no limits to how you're allowed to dress yourself. While the term anti-fashion is typically used to describe this very specific moment in fashion history in the 80s and 90s, I feel that it's not really exclusive to any time period or any group of designers. Being avant-garde has always been popular in the underground, and it's always going to be popular. In fact, I feel that there are plenty of designers that fit the description of anti-fashion in this present moment. One particular designer that immediately comes to mind is Iris Van Herpen. She's one of those designers that I'm never really certain they ever actually set out to create wearable clothing. Van Herpen's work is strictly fashion as high art. Most of the pieces are 3D printed or even sculpted, as opposed to being sewn from traditional materials. Her designs are forward-thinking and futuristic, Imagining not what fashion looks like now, but what it might look like at a distant point in the future. Blending together art and science seamlessly. Seamlessly. Get it? Because they're not sewn. But what about anti-fashion that isn't dictated by the runway? Now that social media is an active part of most of our everyday lives, doesn't the whole idea of Fashion Week seem a little bit archaic? Fashion Week has been a subject of critique for some time now, with many stating that it's simply a lavish display of wealth for the super elite. In fact, these days most of us are paying very little attention to luxury brands, opting instead for streetwear brands that feel less out of reach and less out of touch. That was actually a move that Yoji Yamamoto saw coming when he partnered with Adidas to make Y3. However, streetwear does have its own pitfalls, and it's not a coincidence that this is all happening during a rapid boom in the fast fashion industry. When the majority of your sales come from things like graphic tees, it's really easy to take the fast fashion approach. So what does the intersection of anti-fashion and streetwear look like? Well, for starters, I guess this. And perhaps this, maybe this, and well, there is one designer that I'm particularly fond of. If you've never heard the name Penelope Gazzard before, let me give you a quick overview on why she is my personal lord and savior. She's an artist, and I originally discovered her through Etsy. Etsy is kind of a weird site that loves making weird business decisions, and they tend to not really like swears or nudity much, and since swears and nudity are like super fun. Gazin and her business partner Kate Dwyer decide to launch an off-brand version of the site called Witchsea. Witchsea is a curated site that offers goods from various independent artists that normally wouldn't be able to sell on Etsy. However, all of this costs money, and they didn't have any. So they went to apply for loans. But wouldn't you know it, a website where you can buy jars of toenail clippings run by two women isn't something that people like to really invest in. Emphasis on the two women part. So they decide to invent a man. Keith Man, and list him as a business partner. And since apparently an imaginary man is more trustworthy than two real-life women, he managed to get them the job despite not existing. And then this story makes it into Forbes. Of course, being an agent of chaos in the business world wasn't quite enough for Penelope Gazin. So she starts designing clothes, discovers making clothes is also super fun, and launches a fashion brand company. Fashion brand company claims that they don't even make clothes for humans. They turned down an opportunity to be in vogue. Uh, in fact, they don't do any influencer marketing. Believe me, if they did, I'd be all over that. I have no problems in my life. I simply need more fashion brand companies. 
Sometimes their garments don't have the correct number of legs or neck holes. I honestly can't think of any brand quite as wild and odd as fashion brand company. And that really says something considering my personal taste. It's no secret that the fashion industry is full of problems, including poor labor practices, unsustainable material sourcing, an insufferably pretentious social climate, and all around very narrow ideals regarding personal value. And it seems that the function of anti-fashion is largely to call those problems out. Because anti-fashion is not actually against fashion at all. It is simply anti-trend and anti-status quo. Anti-fashion says, let's forget the business side of things. Let's forget profit. And let's instead elevate this to art. Let's see garments not as clothing, but as wearable sculpture. And in the process of divorcing fashion from clothing, we can redefine what fashion and personal style can be. I'm sure the majority of you watching this recognized at least one name that I mentioned, or at least one piece of clothing that I showed you. Because most of us here have a pretty solid interest in at least one alternative fashion. And I'm sure many of you have already noticed some overlap between anti-fashion and alternative fashion. If anti-fashion is fashion that is designed in defiance to current day trends, and alternative fashion is any fashion that deviates away from mainstream trends, then well, how exactly are these two things different? And honestly, I think there really only is one clear factor that truly separates and defines the two as distinct individual things. Alternative fashions usually, generally, are accompanied by some sort of subcultural movement. Some sort of community. Goths have goth clubs. Punks have punk shows. Lolitas have tea parties. E-kids have TikTok. But anti-fashion typically doesn't have a set community behind it. It is a purposeful singularity, created specifically to stand out, to not be like anything else, but instead completely original. Or what passes for completely original. But we can see how anti-fashion has led to the creation of various alternative fashions. I mean, what would punk look like if Vivian Westwood hadn't been around to introduce plaid and fetish gear? Those leg straps? That was Westwood. The first time I went into Malcolm's store here in England and I saw these bondage pants, you know, that had straps on them where you're supposed to like strap your legs together. And it seemed like the dumbest idea in the world to me. I mean, how are you gonna walk? Just kind of bounce, bounce down the street? I thought nobody's gonna wear that. And I came back in about six months later and all these kids with their legs strapped together bouncing down the street. <laughs> so while alternative fashion and anti-fashion are different things, they don't exist in a vacuum, and they absolutely do influence each other. And in essence, they both give the same message. Dress in whatever makes you feel good, not what other people expect you to wear. Before wrapping up this video, I asked you guys over on Instagram what you think anti-fashion looks like in 2021 and beyond. Now that alternative fashion in general is experiencing a huge popularity boom, thank you social media, it's getting noticeably harder and harder to shock people with your originality. So here are some of the replies that I got. <laughs> the first one is uh, Crocs, just in general, Crocs. Not buying name brands, making or modifying your own clothes. I like this one in particular, just fuck designer brands. Being totally naked seems anti-fashion to me, but if we're talking being clothed, alternative fashion. Not buying newly produced things, slash making your own things, slash buying very few staple things if needed. Skipping fast fashion and not caring about seasons or trends, wearing clothes for yourself. Not buying fast fashion, being more personal with your outfit choices rather than following trends. Handmaking things I need for everyday wear. Purposefully avoiding trends and fads. A way of dressing that rejects the idea that a person should wear what they do to communicate who they are and what role in society they wish to embody. Anti-ego fashion that juxtaposes who a person is perceived as by adorning what is their opposite. It seems like defining your own style instead of others dictating what fashion is. I'd compare it to the art movement of the early 1900s called Dadaism, where you test the limits of art by seeing how far you can go. It's so abstract that it makes you think, 
is this really art slash fashion? There were some more really great responses, but this video is dragging on. <laughs> so, in conclusion, anti-fashion helps us to understand the nature of fashion by pushing it to its limits. It also helps us understand the industry's shortcomings. That's all for today's video. I sincerely hope we were all able to learn something new, or perhaps just look at things from a new point of view. I hope everyone has a good day, and I'll see you all next time. Bye! Thank you.